your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people, just like you, who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is back by popular demand, but he has a very special guest with him. You loved him mainly because you loved listening to his accent, and he's all the way from Australia. It's Dr. Greg Fitzgerald, but accompanying him today is his wife and assistant of many years, Dawn. Please welcome the Fitzgeralds to the show. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Chef AJ. Thanks, great, to, AJ. great to be back and great to be talking to your uh, very devoted following. Well, we yeah, just we love, have... we love the way you sound. So we're just going to keep talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Australian accent, um, it, it does get a lot of interest when we go to America. Mm. They, they love the Aussie accent. But of course, we don't think we have an accent, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think I love the way it sounds. I do. So it's so nice to meet you, Don. Thank you. It's nice to meet you too. I, I did see you last year at the NHA conference. In right, but I mean, mm -hmm, but this is the first Very time good. having you on the show, so it's nice to see you here, and I'd love to hear more of your story. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to share some stuff with you today. Yeah, well, look, we've been working together for 36 years. We, um, we've been together for 36 years, and my career in osteopathy and chiropractic and uh, naturopathy coincided with meeting Dawn. So she's been with me every step of the way. And she's been integral to the success of the clinic, integral to the, to the success of our seminars. We've been running seminars also for 36 years. And so it's a great team we've got here going. And uh, it's fantastic to have Dawn with me talking because she's been the backbone of the clinic in, in many ways. You know, she's been the assistant. She does some soft tissue work on patients who need it. She's coordinated the clinic, coordinated the seminars. Uh, she's been the, the, the breath of the clinic in many, many ways. And uh, she's been integral to it. So it's great to have her talk. She's a great, uh, she has a great knowledge of nutrition. Uh, and she has uh, involved herself in teaching the nutrition in our seminars now for that length of time, 36 years. So she's going to be sharing some very good ideas today with the audience. But does she cook as good as she looks? Ah. <laughs> she cooks better than she looks, AJ. <laughs> That's one thing I love to do. I do love to cook. And, um, you know, I share a lot of my practical ideas with a lot of our patients because, you know, the first question they ask after a consultation is, well, what, do you, what can we eat? Because when people change from a very conventional way of living and eating onto a more plant-based diet, they're really bamboozled as far as what we actually eat. And as you know, there's a lot of variety in vegan and vegetarian cookery, a lot. And so I usually spend a fair amount of time showing them what they actually can eat. Yeah. Well, it's hard to believe that you've uh, been working with uh, Dr. Fitzgerald for 36 years because you barely look old and you don't barely look 36 yourself. So you must have started when you were just real little. Chef, I, she, honestly, uh, AJ, she doesn't age. And, and everyone who comes to see us as patients who haven't been for, say, 15, 20 years, they all comment and they say, Dawn, you haven't aged. What's going on? Are you in a time warp? And uh, it's just quite incredible that she looks after herself so well. And, um, you know, we'll be talking on what she does to keep so young as well today. It's the lifestyle. The food and the lifestyle, it really does help. <laughs> I agree, but I, I mean, I, I I would think people would do it just for the vanity, if no other reason. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so we've been working, as I said, as a team for 36 years. Our clinic involves a very eclectic style of practice because I deal in physical trauma with patients who hurt themselves, sports injuries. I also deal in people that have had chronic illnesses, you know, heart problems, palpitations, asthma, migraines, uh, menopausal problems, you name it. So... The only thing we don't see really are those things involved in, in, in major trauma, car accidents. So it's been a very eclectic clinic, a very rewarding clinic. Uh, and it's been a great thing to go across to the States for the last three years. This year, of course, was cancelled, as every other event in the world was. Uh, we were looking forward to that. And we'll, we'll look forward to next year. But we've been three years in a row now. The first time that we went to America to one of the hygiene seminars was in 1988. We went across in 1988 and 1989, and we saw Harvey and Marilyn Diamond speak, um, and we got to know Mark and uh, Mark Huberman and many of the other speakers, Dr. Frank Sabatino, etc., Dr. Joel Furman. 
And so we've uh, had some long history with natural hygiene and, and run many seminars over the years with Dr. Alec Burton, uh, the late, great Dr. Alec Burton, who you would have met, I'm sure, uh, AJ, who spoke, I think, for 47 years consecutively at the uh, American Natural Hygiene Association meetings. Uh, his loss is a great loss, of course. So we've had no, none better to teach us this uh, hygiene philosophy and the principles than Dr. Alec Burton. So that's basically our background. We've got three children. Uh, one's 29, one's 27, and one is 22. The 29-year-old is a dietitian. A vegan dietitian. A vegan dietitian who yep. you should get one day on your show. She's wonderful. And yep. she's married to a medical doctor who is also a vegan. Oh, I, hey, they're, I'm booking for January. Please have them contact me. That sounds like a terrific idea. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's right on the ball. He's, uh, he's, a great, he's going to be a great acquisition to the medical fraternity. He, his philosophy, he's, he's beautiful, wonderful human being and a, a, has a great knowledge of nutrition and fasting and everything. So he's a rare bird. And so, yeah, that's, that's our lot. We, we are dedicated to what we do, just like you, AJ, you're dedicated to what you do. You perform a fantastic service to humanity. You've got a large following around the world. Even in New Zealand, we've had people email us and, you know, Australia, right around Australia. You, you can be proud of what you do. Well, thank you. I, 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 I enjoy it. Do you do water fasting at your clinic? No, um, we don't fast. We've got no facilities to water fast. So we do refer them to other people who have facilities. But we do um, fast people who live nearby, uh, who can't afford to go other, other areas. We do those if I can go and see them on a regular basis. So although we don't have a live-in establishment here, I do fast people and have done for many, many years, only those that live fairly close. Makes sense. I was just, they have this new thing on Netflix, a, a, a series called Unwell, and they actually, one of the episodes is about water fasting. So Dr. Goldhammer's in it. It's very interesting. Yes, we haven't seen that yet. It's just been released, I hear. Yep. Looking forward to it. Mm. Yeah. So look, we, we're going to talk today, AJ, about what we do. And we're not saying we're perfect. No way. We're not. We don't wear halos. Um, we try and balance our lives out. Dawn uh, and I, yep. as much as we can, no one's perfect. It, it seems to be a, a, a thing that every day you've got to work at your health, every day. You, don't, you can't take it for granted. It's true. We, true, you know, it's, it's work, you know, it's not easy. If you slip back into old habits and you follow and, and you conform to the average person's way of life, the outcome is sickness. That's the definite outcome. It's inevitable. Mm. So you've got to really work at not being sucked back into the, the routines that most people follow. And that is work. You've got to keep yourself on track. And we, we are blessed because we can keep each other on track. That's right. Yeah. And as we heard from somebody else, they said, you don't arrive at a place called health and unpack. You know, you've got to work at it constantly, daily, all the time. <laughs> That's right. So health is like an orchestra. And I gave this talk two years ago in Cleveland. There are four sections to an orchestra and there's four sections to health. And we're going to be talking on those four sections today and how we incorporate those into our daily lives because the, the health of the individual is not contingent just upon one section of an orchestra. The same as great symphony or symphony music is not contingent upon just the string section or the woodwind. It's contingent upon everything working together. So we start our day with meditation. Yes, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we start that meditation. Um, for myself, it's something that um, I've been aware of for a long time, but I really didn't think that I needed it because I'm I'm usually a fairly relaxed person I thought I don't really think I need to meditate I can do relaxation I can do yoga but not so much meditation but I think as I've gotten older and things have changed in my life and with change comes probably a little bit more anxiety um, and especially the the way things are at the moment and so I decided to incorporate meditation into my daily practice so 
So every morning around about the same time, around probably around about seven o'clock in the morning, I re resort to my room, which um, is fortunately I've got a room now. We're, we're sort of entering the empty nest syndrome with our kids. We've only got one here. So I've actually got a room to myself, which is very exciting. <laughs> And I sit there for approximately half an hour. My meditation goes for about half an hour. And in that time, um, it's cool over here in Australia at the moment. It's winter. So I'm nice and warm with my blanket and I concentrate on my breath and take a few deep breaths to begin my meditation, which relaxes me. And then I observe my thoughts initially and I go into this beautiful deep meditation um, it's not always easy every day. Sometimes the, there's a lot of chatter going on in the brain, but eventually towards the end of the meditation, I'm quite calm. At the end of the meditation, I then do about 10 minutes of spiritual reading, uh, which helps, which is a really good setup for the day. And the book that I'm reading at the moment is called The Yoga of Discipline. And it is a fantastic book. Um, it's one that um, you could start from the first page and when you finish it, you can start it all over again. It's quite deep and it's not the sort of book that you read in a hurry, but I find that for me, it's a really good setup for the day. And, and Greg has read it as well. Um, so after the meditation, I try and keep that feeling of calmness and being very focused and mindful. I try and maintain that throughout the day, which is so hard, but to start the day that way, it really does make a difference and it helps me. And there's many uh, benefits to meditating. Um, I've been meditating for probably 30 years because I had anxiety and I'm prone to anxiety if I let my mind run amok with me uh, and just full of psycho babble and, you know, psycho drama. And I realised many years back that, the health of the, of the individual was not just about the food you eat. There was much more to it than that. Uh, too often I see patients come in who are very um, physically healthy, but they're miserable and they're miserably healthy because they never work at their mental state. They're uh, in turmoil often and so on and so forth. So we meditate in different rooms. I did an hour this morning. Dawn did half an hour and it was a, it's a breath meditation that's based on the Buddhist style of meditating. We focus on our breath and just observe our mind as it wanders off and bring it back to our breath. The mind goes off again, we bring it back to our breath. It's a very, very simple meditation. And most people that um, find meditation difficult, the difficult thing about meditation is not the actual technique of sitting down. Anyone can sit down. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to sit down, close your eyes, rest your, your body in a chair and just try and focus your mind on your breath. You don't need a degree to do that. The mo most difficult thing for most people is the permission that they won't allow themselves to sit and ostensibly do nothing. It's that actual permission. Yep. And when people um, go to a, a class at night or in the daytime where they've got 10, 15, 20 people all doing meditation together, it becomes easier then because they've already allowed themselves permission to go and meditate. Whereas when people are busy at home, it's very hard to say, I'm going to spend five, 10, 15, 20 minutes sitting down on my own doing nothing because there's that, there's that overwhelming sense of being selfish, of, of not going and doing more things for the family and for, for work and to earn more money. So it's that permission you give yourself, which is difficult. It's not the actual technique, but the rewards are innumerable yeah honestly and there's even uh, evidence from harvard university now in 2014 where regular meditators for half an hour a day for six months showed an increase in the hippocampus in their brain an increase in the size they started to have better memories they didn't um, forget things as easily and so there is an actual physical benefit to the brain from meditating which is quite incredible. And they're finding more and more and more about that now. In fact, many cancer patients are resorting to meditating um, to help you know, boost and augment the immune system. So I won't go into all the benefits of meditating because it would take two hours, mm. but just 
understand there are physical benefits, emotional benefits. There's benefits that, that, that transcend just what you do when you start eating good food. There, there's some real benefits which we'd recommend people do, even starting with two or three minutes, sitting down and just focusing on your breath, making sure you're just relaxed. And if you can't do it any, every day, any time is good enough, you know, if, if, and you may not be able to do it at the same time every day, but 10 minutes is better than nothing at all. So don't think that you've got to sit down for the half hour or the hour thinking, I haven't got time. You just fit in whatever you can and it's beneficial. I find that with, with the, the three-legged stool, exercise, meditation, eating right, that it seems to be the most difficult thing for people to do. And it's interesting because I'm hosting a summit based solely on GI health now, and they're showing that for GI diseases, meditation actually improves the outcomes. Totally. Uh, as you know yourself, GI diseases are often linked to the emotions. You know, sure, they're very much linked to what we eat. There's no doubt about that. But if you forget the emotions and just focus on what you eat, you're missing one piece of the jigsaw. And with GI, GI illnesses, like particularly irritable, irritable bowel syndrome um, and the other diseases that are more serious, like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, a peaceful mind goes a long way to a peaceful gut. And the microbiome is very much influenced by your state of mind, mm -hmm. the microbiome. Um, we'll be talking on that today because there's so many things that impact the microbiome, um, which is a focus of study these days like never before. So I love that. We do after we meditate, we drive down the beach. And we've got a picture here that uh, Dawn will put up of us doing our exercise down the beach. And we do this almost daily. And that's a photo of Dawn and myself down at the beautiful beach where we walk every day. It's absolutely stunning. And you wouldn't believe it, but this was a summer's day two years ago. Sorry, this was a winter's day, my mistake. A winter's day, <laughs> a winter's day two years ago. Can you believe it? People yeah. over living in Boston and New York where they get snowed out, they can't believe that this was one of our winter days. And we walk along this beach for an hour. Um, and so we walk fairly briskly. It's a wonderful way to start the day. And in summer, we go for a swim in that beautiful water. Um, and we take our chance with all the sharks. And of course, we take our beautiful four-legged friend, Billy, the dog. You can just see the, just sort of the top of his ears there. I had to cut him off. But uh, it's a great way to start the day. It's only 10 minutes from where we live. We're very, very fortunate. And if we can't walk on the beach like if we're traveling or whatever walking is something we have always done it's always been a priority for us and the, the the best thing about walking you can do it anywhere anytime it doesn't cost you anything you're getting some sunshine fresh air and movement and that is a really really good combination absolutely you know there's been a lot of studies done showing that walking speed is very much related to one's overall uh, longevity and uh, walking speed, slow walking, people that can't walk very fast um, are really disadvantaging themselves um, uh, in the longevity stakes. Brisk walking doesn't have to be flat out, but fairly brisk, as brisk as you can manage it. And it's interesting too, to the audience, this is going to be of an interest to them, that the muscle in the body that has the closest correlation to your longevity is the quadriceps muscle in your thighs, which is most interesting because when you're walking, what are you using? You're using the quadriceps and the hamstring muscles in your legs, as well as um, your calf muscles, of course. But that quadricep muscles get really worked very well when you walk. And, and that is the muscle they realize now has the closest uh, prediction to your longevity. That's not including your heart muscle, which of course is, is, a, is not a, a voluntary muscle. I'm talking of the skeletal muscles, like you know, all the muscles in your body that are attached to bones, whereas your heart is not attached to a bone. But the, that quadricep muscle is so important. So we walk up hills, yep. we walk all around the place, and we've done it ever since we've been together. Ever since, yeah. In fact, the first thing we do when we go into mm -hmm. Cleveland every year, we walk, go <laughs> for a walk, just to see the place and get out and, and walk and get some, some air into the lungs and some sun if it's out, etc. And walking is an aerobic exercise. So it, it helps the cardiovascular system. 
And the quicker you walk, of course, the more benefits to the cardiovascular system. But some days we're feeling a bit tired. You know, we might have put in a very big day at work the day before. We might not have slept as well as we normally would. In those situations, we don't push ourselves and walk very, very fast. We might just cut back the pace and walk a bit slower um, because it's very important to walk appropriately and to exercise appropriately. We also do anaerobic exercise. So we both go to the gym yep. and I do gardening, etc. And that of course helps the anaerobic um, uh, type of exercise, which builds up muscle strength, tone, etc. And so we both, we coordinate both the aerobic, which is walking and I play tennis as well. We've got a picture here of myself with Dr. Furman and um, Anthony Lim, Dr. Lim, when we're in uh, Cleveland a couple of years back, we were playing tennis, which was um, a real blast. Well, uh, we have to we have to know who won. What a good looking crew. Of course. Well, I'll tell you what, if Anthony Lim wasn't a doctor, he would be a professional tennis player. So he is a really fine tennis player. That's Dr. Anthony Lim in the middle. Of course, Dr. Joel there. And there's myself uh, on, on our left as we're looking at that particular picture. And this was in Cleveland two years ago. And uh, Anthony, of course, won. And Joel and I are about the same level. We play a reasonable game of tennis. We're a lot older than Anthony. So he had uh, a lot of more better fitness on his side. However, we, uh, we love our game. Joel's an avid tennis fan, as I am. I play every week. And, uh, and that gives me aerobic conditioning as well. Look how lean and uh, fit these guys look, hey? Quite and amazing. they did it on plants. Yeah, they live on plants. Amazing. Well, Anthony there's eating a banana, so he, he's showing the way already. And Joel's just about to eat that tennis ball in his left hand. <laughs> That's terrific. They're, they're very, very competitive, especially when Greg and, jo and Joel play. It's, it's a competitive game, isn't it? Very competitive. Yes. Yep. They're very even. So, so Bonnie wants to know if you have any advice for a walking replacement for someone with a lower body motility issue. Go into a pool. If you've got a pool handy, go and do some pool walking, which takes the weight of the body off the legs. And you can do that. We've got a number of patients who can't perambulate, which means walk. They can't perambulate properly. And they go to a heated pool and they do their exercise in a heated pool. And this is a very good uh, exercise for people who are extremely elderly as well, mm. where their joints are a problem and they can't put a lot of pressure on their joints and they can go into a pool. You can also do other exercises on stationary bikes, very gentle on stationary bikes. You can do stationary rowers. There's always a way to do some form of activity, yep. always. Yep. There's no excuse. Yep. And um, also, it's really important to do something that you enjoy, something that you like. I mean, when people say that they don't like to go to the gym or they don't like to run, well, you don't, they're not the only forms of exercise. You know, you do something that you love. Like, I love yoga. And so I do yoga. I find that is fantastic for me. The combination of yoga, weights, and walking for me just suits me, suits my body. And uh, I used to like dragon boat racing because I love being on the water. But after a while, that became quite intense. And, and um, you know, I started to feel that my body wasn't responding after five years. So I gave that away and decided to do something that was less intense. So there's always something that we've got to enjoy it. Absolutely. It's most important to incorporate regular physical activity into your lifestyle. It's critically important not only for the physical benefits of better muscle tone, better cardiovascular health, et cetera, it also helps prevent osteoporosis because the bones get stronger as your muscles get stronger. One of the big problems in Western civilization is a illness or not an illness. It's a condition called sarcopenia, which is a, a wastage of muscle as one gets older. And it doesn't even have to be when you get older. There's a lot of people I know in their 30s and 40s who are experiencing sarcopenia simply because they don't exercise. They don't use their muscles. And when you use a muscle, you use a bone. So if you want to keep your bones strong, you must keep your muscles strong. You can't have strong bones without strong muscles. That's an impossibility. 
So sarcopenia will often lead to osteopenia, which is a diminution of the, of the density of the bone. And that will often lead, if you're not careful, to osteoporosis. They're not the same thing. Osteopenia is not the same as osteoporosis. But if you're not careful, one can lead to the other. And osteoporosis means an increased risk of, of low trauma fracture. And that, of course, is very, very problematical as you get older. We don't want that to happen. And so the benefits of exercise far outweigh any inconvenience that people might experience by allocating a certain amount of time. We exercise most days. Do we exercise every day? Uh, most days, but not every day. If we're feeling a bit, you know, a bit tired or a bit run down, we definitely don't exercise if we're unwell. And we, cert we, rec don't rec we recommend that to our patients. If they're unwell, do not exercise. You're best to stay in bed and rest and just let the body heal itself. Um, so, but mostly, you know, we do some form of exercise because we're usually okay. Yeah. But if I'm fasting, of course, or Dawn's fasting, we don't exercise at all. Um, if we're not well, which is rare, we don't, we don't exercise. Um, if we've got uh, a very, very busy day mentally, yeah. for example, if I've got a very hectic day with patients and then I've got a seminar to do at night, I will not do anything of any intensity whatsoever. No. Um, I'm, I've learned lessons over the years because intensity can be your friend, but it can also be your enemy and it can cause problems particularly when you haven't got much energy. And this is what the natural hygienists have been saying for many decades, is that these biological needs we're talking about, you know, the need for good food, the need for exercise, the need for rest and sleep, they must be applied appropriately to every individual. And a couple of months ago, AJ, on your show, I talked about the appropriateness of activity, how you've got to do it appropriately so that when you're feeling unwell or you've got a temperature or you're overly, you know, um, committed, and you're very exhausted, it is inappropriate to push yourself with exercise, totally inappropriate. And it can cause sickness. It can suppress the immune system. But one of the benefits of exercise done regularly, and this is the next slide, is that it increases the gut microbiome diversity. And with your uh, show coming up, AJ, about this, this is most interesting. This was in the journal called Gut, June the 9th of 2014. Exercise increases gut microbiome diversity. Now, in our gut, as you know, AJ, you've got about a thousand species of, of bacteria. Um, these bacteria, of course, are essential for our well-being physically, for the digestion and the absorption of food, for the elaboration of certain enzymes and the elaboration and the um, absorption of certain vitamins, etc. But it's also the microbiome is essential for um, well-being mentally. And so when you're out walking, understand that you are increasing the microbiome diversity. You're giving your body a greater range of different bacteria in the gut, which is just astounding. So you're not only benefiting your muscles and your bones when you're out walking or playing tennis or playing golf or whatever you want to do, lifting weights, you're actually increasing the, the bacterial diversity in your gut, which increases your well-being and increases the absorption of foodstuffs, etc. It's quite incredible. The benefits of exercise transcend just your, your muscles and your bones. Understand that. You also sleep better. So when you're exercising regularly, you um, go into bed, you'll sleep more deeply, uh, you'll have uh, more recuperation, from the day before than if you don't exercise. We find it very unbelievable that most Australians don't get enough exercise. And I'm sure that's the same in America, that most Americans don't get enough. You just got to look at the size of them. You know, most people in Western countries are carrying too much weight. We've got 33% obesity in Australia. You've got the same in America. We've got 75 to 85% of the adult population in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same in the States, are overweight. They're not obese, they're overweight. Now, this is something you never see in the, in the wild. You never see wildebeest in Africa overweight. We never see rabbits in the wild overweight. I never see a squirrel overweight. The only overweight animals on earth are three in number. And what are they doing? Well, they're dogs, cats, 
And humans. And humans. Yeah. <laughs> because they're the only ones that aren't eating the right diet. That's it. That's right. And feeding the dogs and cats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's how we, we start our day with meditation and then exercise. And we've got that out of the road. And then we come back and we'll have our breakfast. Yeah. So it's a really good setup for the day. And, and uh, you know, I know that some people, it's difficult because you're working and we work from home, which is really um, good for us. We're very fortunate, but we have been working outside of the home. So we've, you know, it's a bit of a juggling act, but even if you can't do a lot of it, as I said before, if you do a little bit of it, a little bit of exercise, a little bit of meditation, it is a really good setup for the day. So yeah, so then we have breakfast and I've just put up, I've just created a couple of slides because in our practice, we, we often get asked, well, what do you eat? Because after we go through all the things that we don't recommend um, people eating, well, it's then, well, what do you eat? So I thought, well, okay, we eat very simply. And um, even though I love to cook, um, I love to cook and I can, in the past, I probably had a tendency to probably make things that were a little bit too complicated. And over the years, I think for better health, it's best to have foods that are quite simple. So I'm just gonna share with you just some of the things that, that we have um, for breakfast, lunch and dinner, just to give people an idea because it's not a, a cooking demo. I thought it was easy just to prepare a couple of slides. So the first slide here, what do we eat? Um, on the right hand side is Greg and it, this is our son Jesse who is a, a bodybuilder and in front of Jesse and Greg is our weekly um, marketing produce that we get um, at a local market. We eat mainly organic produce but um, sometimes if we can't get it we just get nice fresh, fresh food from the, the market and our diets revolve around fruits and vegetables legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds. The majority of our diet is, as I said, revolves around those, those food groups. Um, so the legumes, we have lots of different legumes, whole grains, mainly quinoa, oats, brown rice, and some nuts and seeds, usually raw and unsalted. So these are some slides of our breakfast, what we have. Um, on the right here, we've got some beautiful red papaya, which is Greg's favourite. This is his standard breakfast most mornings. Yum. And he, yeah, he hasn't had it yet, so he's looking at it and he's probably very hungry. <laughs> so in the papaya, we've got some beautiful raw unsalted nuts and seeds, some berries, and up the top here is a, a custard apple. Um, I don't know whether you actually call them custard apples in, in the US. Um, I know that I saw Joel Furman and his wife, Lisa, um, on one of your programs had done some marketing and they had a whole crate of them and they were getting stuck into them. So is it uh, a chirimoya by any chance? I'm not sure. Um, we call it a custard apple. No, I'm not sure. We don't know, but they're beautiful. It's beautiful, sweet flesh. Um, and it's only seasonal for about a couple of months of the year in our winter. Um, so I usually like mine chopped up in, in, rather than having it in the little papaya boats like Greg, but it doesn't matter how you eat it as long as you eat it. Um, there's just um, some peas, some fresh peas. Greg absolutely loves fresh peas and why not have them for breakfast? Occasionally we'll have some oat porridge with banana or, or some ground flaxseed. Um, now that's only on the occasion, more so in winter when it's cooler here. Um, but in summer, we, we normally have just fresh fruit with some nuts and seeds. Now for lunch, um, once again, very, very simple stuff. I like to make a lot of one bowl meals and it usually consists of some sort of green salad base, maybe some grain like some quinoa, and then maybe some tofu or some uh, veggie patties um, some edamame beans, something like that, and a homemade dressing, whether it be raw, but there's usually a combination of raw and cooked vegetables, but really simple and easy to prepare. So at the beginning of the week, I might make a really big salad, which that'll last us for about three days as a base. I'll always have some form of quinoa and I'll usually make some tofu or have some sweet potato rings 
And then when it's lunchtime, I can usually throw it together real quick. If I was, you know, having to go out to work, well, I would prepare it the night before so that I would take it to work. But we don't have to do that because now we work from home. Um, sometimes we just have some open salad sandwiches, um, which is pretty simple. Everybody can do a salad sandwich or a wrap. The Bragg's organic sprinkles, I find, adds a nice touch to a salad sandwich, makes it just makes it pop. And that's the seed bread we use? Oh, yes. The seed bread we use is this one here. It's spring and it's made out of different um, grains. Seeds. And seeds, sorry. Not, this one is grains. seeds. That's right, this one is seeds. Um, the rice paper rolls I make up, which are really simple with tofu and vegetables and a dipping sauce that I make. Might be some purple rice with tofu, with tofu in a sushi and salad. And then this is one of our standard meals that we've been having for, gosh, years since we've known each other. And, you know, you don't re doesn't require a recipe. Everybody can bake vegetables. Everyone can steam vegetables and make salad. And uh, so there is no recipe for this. Um, on the left, I've got salad veggies, baked veggies, steamed corn, some hummus and beans, and some avocado. That is a standard meal that we have a lot, and we absolutely love it. Beautiful. It is really good. And sometimes, you know, that can be lunch, that can be dinner. Um, in the warm, in the cooler weather around in winter, I make a lot of different types of soups and stews and uh, or curries with some rice and vegetables once again really really simple stuff yes um so that's basically you know we, we that's what we have um it's not as i said it's not it's not difficult to prepare and um you know you don't need to have a lot of time um i do like to prepare a lot of things in the morning before the day starts so that we've got something for the day because Things can get pretty busy here. Uh, I don't do a lot of batch cooking anymore because there's just Greg and I, so I can we can be a little bit more spontaneous. Um, but the idea is to is to keep it simple. Um, if you're eating lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds, um, you really can't go wrong. Yeah, I'm gluten free, so Dawn's not gluten free. I find gluten aggravate my gut. Um, and so I stay away from gluten. And gluten, of course, is found in three grains. It's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And we've found, I've found over the years that many patients with gut problems like IBS are sensitive to gluten. I found when I was, had IBS many, many years ago, I had alternating um, constipation and, and, and loose stools for some time. And I went off gluten. And it made a difference. It wasn't the only thing that I did, but it, I know it makes a difference. If I go back on gluten, it affects me. It affects my gut, but it also affects target organs. People don't understand that you, you, you don't necessarily have to be affected in the gut to be affected adversely through gluten. It can travel through the blood into an, an organ or an, an area of the body, which we'd call a target organ, and cause problems in that area of the body, which is quite distant to the gut. Some people get gut upset, some people get skin problems, eye problems, whatever, due to certain foods such as gluten. I find, I know in the true north now, I don't think Dr. Goldhammer has any gluten at all. Right. Um, yeah. And so I've, uh, I've been recommending patients don't eat gluten for a long, long time. Even Dawn's gone largely yeah. off gluten, even sure. though, and she found her joints even felt better when she yeah. came off it. Oh, for sure. Made a difference. Yeah. So be careful of gluten. Um, also, when you're a vegan, you've got to make sure you do supplement. And we take a B12 supplement. Um, our supplement of B12 is about six micrograms a day. Um, we have taken supplements in the past that are about 500 milligrams, but that incorporates, and I said this two years ago at one of the uh, seminars in Cleveland, at the Q&A night, uh, when someone asked me what the dose of B12 was, I said 500 milligrams. Well, that wasn't true. It was 500 mils was the compound supplement, which included B3 and B6 and B9. But the microgram a fraction of that is um, micrograms, that rather is the B12 is five or six micrograms, which is a methylcobalamin we take. Uh, and we only take about two a week. Yep. We don't take it every day. Um, and we also take a DHA supplement, about 255 
of DHA, um, docosohexanoic acid, which is a, a very strong component of your brain. So cognitive health depends upon omega-3s, DHA is an omega-3, and of course your B12. So if you're a vegan, you must look at supplementing judiciously. Um, I'm sure your speakers have said that in the past, AJ. Absolutely. I'm sure you take a supplement. That uh, B12 is non-negotiable, a 43-year vegan, so absolutely. So when you were starting your slide presentation, you the first one had your son, and everybody went nuts about how good-looking he was, and is he single? Huh. Oh, he's just... He's just now got a, a, a girlfriend, a serious girlfriend. He's had plenty, but this one he's serious about. So, he, yeah, he's a he's not a vegan though, um, but um, he's uh, very much into bodybuilding and he eats a lot of good, all the good stuff that we prepare. But he eats too many animals, as far as we're concerned. <laughs> you know, when, when I was his age, I used to eat animals. Um, and so we can't judge anyone and I can't, we can't force him no. to comply with our philosophy. Um, he agrees that our lifestyles are the ideal, but he said, dad, mom, you know, I'm 27, you know, I, I want to eat a bit of meat and I want to train hard and I want to look good. And who am I to say don't? Well, wait, has he seen Game Changers though? He has, he has. He has. We, we, we definitely got them to see, oh, yes. both the boys, we got them to see Game Changers. And he, and he did cut back on his animal protein somewhat after that show, you know, when he saw Arnold Schwarzenegger and all those guys. Um, but it, it, it's crept back in. Mind you, he's a very healthy fellow and he, he, he knows when he gets sick, he doesn't eat. Like he's hardly ever, ever, ever um, been sick. He's very strong, very healthy. He knows the principles of hygiene. If he gets sick, he doesn't eat. He fasts. Um, he doesn't train when he's not well. If he does, if he feels a bit tired, because he does a very physical job as well. But certainly, the the, the young girls love him. Oh, I can tell. <laughs> do, do you have some of the same kitchen equipment tools that we have here? Like, for example, an instant pot or an air fryer. Is that something you have in Australia? We don't have the instant pot, um, but we have what's called a thermomix. Have you heard of a thermomix? I have. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I'm really surprised that it, it, it's not popular in, a, in America because it, it's very popular around Europe and here in Australia. And it is fantastic. The only thing it, it doesn't do that maybe the instant pot does, it's not a pressure cooker. But it blends, it chops, it heats, um, it makes sorbet. It, it is absolutely brilliant. And and I purchased a Thermomix about five years ago, and it is a, a great appliance to have. But the Instant Pot, I'm very, very interested in um, because we don't have it here. So I'm thinking next time we go to the States, I might bring one back. Because <laughs> I see a lot of your cooking demos and everybody uses the Instant Pot. Yeah, and I it, them why. yeah they're, they're really great. What about air fryers? Do you have air fryers in Australia? Yes, yes. I've just actually, for Mother's Day, my kids bought me an air fryer. So um, we have a fan-forced oven. So up until recently, I was using a fan-forced oven. But I can honestly say after using the air fryer, it is just so quick and so easy. So, yes, I love it. Oh, here's, yeah. I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Alinda yeah. wants to know if you guys know Philip Wolin. Philip Wolin. I guess he's no. from Australia. I guess not. Okay. He, it, Linda, explain who he is in the chat and then I'll tell them. And Susan had a question on osteoporosis. If you have seen it can be reversed maybe with using a weighted vest and she's jumping on a mini trampoline with the weighted vest. Yes. Look, um, osteoporosis um, is of course a, a diminishing of the bone density, the bone matrix, and you can get reversal of that. Depends how bad it is. If you're uh, 80 years of age and you've got multiple fractures in the lumbar vertebrae and broken hips and your, your uh, bones are extremely low density, reversal is very, very difficult. I've never seen anyone reverse osteoporosis in that situation. But when you get osteoporosis in the early stages, when the T-score is not too damaging, and it's not just a weighted vest. I know Joel Furman recommends a weighted vest and I think they're great. But it's the whole package, AJ. It's not just what you exercise. It's not just that you've got to feed the bones as well. You've got to feed them the full complement of micronutrients and plant-based chemicals. Um, you've got to look at the nutrition. You've got to look at sleep. You've got to look at rest and sunshine and vitamin D because vitamin D helps facilitate calcium absorption. 
So it's not just a weighted vest and exercise. They are terrific. But if your diet's suboptimal, what are you going to build? You've got to have the raw materials. You've got to have the good tucker, the good food. Yep. And you've got to balance your life out. Stress is another thing that leaches calcium from the bone. So you need to look at your mental state. Again, we look at meditation. So the lady's on the right track, but she's not on the only track. Weighted belts and exercise is not the only track. You've got to have other tracks to the road to strong bones. Strong bones is just like a strong heart or strong liver, strong kidney. Um, you've got to have the whole package. You've got to look at health from a holistic standpoint, not just become obsessed with one area and think that exercise will do it or the diet will do it and I can forget the rest. No, it doesn't work like that. No. Yep. Right? Nice. Do you, I don't know where OLD is, but Devon is saying, do you know any medically supervised fasting in OLD? I, do you know where OLD is? QLD? Oh, 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 is it a Q? I'm sorry. Queen. Queensland, Australia. Queensland. Hello. Got to wear glasses. Sorry, Devin. Queensland, Queensland, Australia. Devin wanted to know if you know any places. There is a, a place in Queensland run by a Dr. John Fielder. F-I-E-L-D-E-R. You can Google him. John Fielder. Now, he's been around for many, 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 many decades. And I know he's probably near 90, but he still runs his fasting establishment up in Queensland somewhere. Um, that's the only place that I know of that supervise fasts in Queensland. Nice. So Annette says, would be interested in what you would say about avascular necrosis. Well, avascular necrosis, that's, can I have more details about that? Who's got it? What the age of the person is? Because I need to know more about the actual context. Right. Because necrosis why means death of, avascular means you're not getting blood vessels supplying oxygen and so forth and so on. You've got to look again, AJ, there's no cures, there's no remedies for these things. You know, you've got to look at the, the forest, not the trees. We, 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 we beseech all of your listeners to look at health from a very natural, holistic and hygienic perspective and not to seek out remedies, not to seek out things that are reductionist. Modern medicine is very reductionist. You know, they look at one thing can cure one disease. Well, that doesn't work in the long run. So with avascular necrosis, we'd have to look at the person's diet. We'd have to look at the person's weight. Are they carrying too much weight? What's their exercise pattern like? What medications are they on? You know, because if you're dealing with the death, the death of tissue um, and you're dealing with avascular situations here, where the blood vessels are compromised. So you've got to look at what, what leads to blood vessel health. You've got to look at the full symphony of nutrients, all the anthocyanins with the purple uh, blueberries and things like that, which can help blood vessels. And so it's not just a simple answer as a throwaway line like, oh, yes, you can take vitamin C and that'll cure avascular necrosis. That's not as simple as that. Yeah, that makes sense because a lot of these questions, you're right, that they need to see someone like yourself. But you don't you don't see people outside of Australia, do you? We do. We do Zoom consults around the world. Well, that's good to know because some of these questions are so specific, like from Sherry, whether it's the best food to eat for an underactive thyroid. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you've got to look at everything in context. If, if we don't look at things in context, we become very medical. Um, and you, you're looking at illnesses and diseases as, as separate entities, which then require separate treatments. Well, true natural health doesn't come about through that. You've got to look at the whole forest, not just the trees. So with the thyroid, I'm treating patients at the moment with different thyroid problems. I'm treating a couple of patients with Graves' disease. I'm treating a few patients with Hashimoto's, which is hypothyroidism. I've got a lady at the moment on day 17 of a fast who's got um, thyroid cancer and she's fasting. Um, and she's got parathyroid uh, problems as well and she's got a parotid tumor. And so you've got to look at the whole context of the person, look at the whole lifestyle. Don't look for answers, a short term answer. Look at the whole thing, seek out a practitioner that you can talk to who will ask a lot of questions who will become Sherlock Holmes in your life. That's what you need. You need someone to ask you specific questions about what you're, how you're treating yourself. And then you can 
adjust those things on that person's recommendations and you'll see some terrific results. But don't just look at the problem as a thyroid problem. Sure, you might have a thyroid issue, but you've got to look at the entire body first because when the, when the, the tide rises, all the boats lift. So when your general health gets better, mm. everything about your health gets better. You don't just get one boat rise. You don't just get a, a thyroid get better. Yeah. You've got to look at the entire body and you've got to look at your diet very closely with thi thyroid issues. Get off stimulants, coffee, tea, alcohol. Get off those things. That's the first thing. Stop stimulating the self. Uh, and, and then you look at your diet. It's, it's become so specialized medicine, you know, that that, that, that that tends to happen. Shelley says, do you know what causes a goiter? Does gluten have anything to do with it? Definitely. Now, we're getting into specific medical issues here, and that's good. But certainly, if you've got a goiter, you've got to do what I've just said. You've got to look at your entire lifestyle. Because as you're looking at goiter, you're looking at the body. You know, it's not just the thyroid. But certainly, you, you've got to address this very seriously because... When you've got a health issue, I encourage my patients to regard that as a protest by the body. The body's protesting. And when the body's protesting, we must listen to it. And it's not just treating the thyroid or treating the goiter. The goiter's a protest. Why is the protest there? You've got to look at your, what you're eating, what you're drinking, how you're sleeping, how you're resting, how you're exercising what medications you're on for what reasons have you got comorbidities it's no coincidence that most people who are dying of COVID-19 have comorbidities no coincidence they're sick people most of them and so most people have to look at their lives in context not in isolation don't look at illnesses in isolation look at it in context there are things you can do for goiter no problem about that but you've got to look at what you look at the whole life which is what we're trying to get across today is the balance, the balance. I love that you say coffee, tea and alcohol are not good because so many doctors, even plant-based doctors say, well, they have some benefits because just because of something has benefits in one area doesn't mean that overall it's going to be good. Very true, AJ. What you've said is that is gold. What you've just said, gold, because what is good in one area of the body does not necessarily mean it's good for the whole. And this is what I call collateral damage. You know, sure, coffee can spark you up and, and, and get you alert, but there's collateral damage to it. And one must ask a question at all times. Is what I'm doing, does, that, does it have any collateral damage to me? Now, if you eat papaya for breakfast, there's no collateral damage to that. It doesn't do any disadvantage to the body. Whereas if you have coffee, it might give you a bit of a perk up, but it has a disadvantage. It is anxiogenic. It creates anxiety in the body, etc. It increases heart rate. So when you've got something like coffee, tea and alcohol uh, and red meat, people say, oh, these things have a benefit. Of course, red meat does contain certain nutrients. But the downside is that the damage done by meat, not just red meat, is far greater than the benefits you get from the few nutrients you get in it. You've got to look at the collateral damage of everything we do. Coffee has too much collateral damage to justify being taken just because it contains some antioxidants. I agree with what you've said, AJ, 100%. Well, thank you. I, you, know, you know what Dr. Goldhammer says? He says, I always assess someone's intelligence by how much they agree with me. <laughs> uh, he's got an acute sense of humor hasn't he i i do i adore him so do, do you someone's asking did dawn speak about 21 days to transform your health did i speak about it is that a program you guys have greg greg the last program the last um presentation he did with you was transform your health in 21 days so yes that is correct we run a program called transform your health in 21 days and we do it online as well as live. We do seminars. We haven't done seminars now for six months because of COVID, but uh, we have we run them online. If people want to know more about this, and if people send me their emails, my email address is greg at healthforlife.com.au. Anyone listening to this who sends me um, their email and a request, I will send them some details of that. And also a couple of other articles on the balance of life, which I have, I can send out to you that are written by myself. 
on the balance of life, incorporating this into a balance. So if you send me your email on greg at healthforlife.com.au, I'll gladly return that with the, uh, with the attached articles for yourselves. All right, I just did that. Thank you so much. People really enjoy you guys together. So you're a good, you're a good match. We, you know, we just had Dr. John and Dr. Mary McDougall on together. People like seeing, yes. you know, the, the couples. And I did see that. It was, it was great. It was really lovely to see them together. Yeah. Well, you guys come back in another twenty years when you're there. <laughs> you can come back sooner than that. This is great. So it's funny because we're getting ready for dinner here and you're just starting your day here in Australia. We are. We're getting ready for breakfast. I'd like to put one more slide up, AJ. Of course. Could, Please. Which is for the full enjoyment of food. This is a, a great quote. And um, people often say to me, Greg, how often should I eat? And um, my response to that generally is when you're hungry, don't go by the clock. Go by your hunger and your appetite. And Joel, Dr. Joel Furman, people call it to live, talks about this toxic hunger, that people become toxic hunger. They get toxic hunger and they eat when they're not genuinely hunger, hungry. And we've always thought that when animals um, eat, they eat when they're hungry. And hunger is in the mouth. It's not in the tummy. It's a sensation in the mouth where you feel more saliva. You feel like there's a, a relish to eat food. You want to eat. You, you, you're hungry, genuinely hungry. It's not an indication in the stomach, it's in the mouth. And so what we, this quote is a beautiful quote. For the full enjoyment of food, the best cook is hunger by Hans Selye. And Hans Selye wrote a book many, many decades ago called Stress Without Distress. And um, it's a great read. And he's got that great quote. Hunger is so important because it means that there's enzymes in the mouth and the stomach which are elaborated, ready to digest the food. But people eat often four, five, six, seven times a day. Uh, and they're just food, food addicts. They're not hungry. It's a little wonder they're overweight, little wonder that their gut is giving them problems mm. and that they feel depressed because we're eating far too frequently. We should only eat when we have a need for eating. We should only exercise when we have a need for exercising. We mustn't exercise when we're exhausted or sick. All of these biological laws and biological uh, requisites for health must be applied appropriately to the human being. When we're eating when we're sick, eating when we're feverish, eating when we're exhausted, eating when we're not hungry at all, just because it tastes good, we are setting ourselves up for sickness. I love that. When should I eat? When you're hungry. And like people say to me, well, how much should I eat? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how hungry you are. You eat till you're full. That's if people have gotten so far away from what is so natural and normal to many people in other parts of the world. Very true, AJ. And in Japan, um, in the Okinawan region of Japan, which is the second longest living culture on earth, um, they're the second longest living of the five blue zones, which was the book written by Dan Buettner um, when he traveled the world for National Geographic and found there were five long living zones in the world. The second longest living were the Okinawans. And they've got this saying, which is hari hachibu. Hari hachibu means stop eating when you're 80% full. And they're the second longest living. And incidentally, the, the longest living culture on earth is in your country, AJ. The longest living. The, 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 the blue zones, zones, Loma Linda, right? Yeah, Loma Linda, California. Yeah. Uh, and so you've got the longest livers over there. We can learn lessons from them. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been really fun talking to you guys. And I love when when it, when people are doing this together as a family. It's, it's got to be so much easier than if one of you wasn't doing this. Very true. Very true. And thank you for having us <laughs> yeah, on, AJ. You. We thank appreciate you your us. work you're doing for humanity, thank seriously. You. Yeah. Well, it's um, my pleasure because I, I just, I love the sound of your voices. You guys should do meditation tapes because it's so, it's so, you're so, so pleasant and soothing your accents. Thank you very much. And again, if anybody wants any information and any articles on what we've talked about, I will send them out straight away. Just send me that email on the email you've got. Great. Take care. Thank you so much. Dr. Greg thank and Don Fitzgerald for being here. And thank all of you guys for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we also have two episodes. A little bit later in the day at 3 p.m., we have Dr. Saray Stanek. She's going to be talking about her amazing film, Code Blue. And at 5 p.m., we are having a live yoga class. So I won't be talking at all other than introducing the guest. It's a gentle yoga class taught by Zoe Shipley at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So please come back. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you AJ. Bye, AJ. Bye. Now. Bye.